I'm Bill Gobbins, and I'm uh, pretty pleased and, and, and honored to be invited to talk to you today on our single stage to orbit program. And our uh, vision for establishing, we think, will be the highway to space, uh, through which not only science and exploration uh, can um, can pass and flow, but also commercial and uh, just plain having fun in space can flourish. We call our program the uh, the Delta Clipper. Delta to uh, recognize our heritage from the world's most reliable launch system, the, the Delta, and Clipper to anticipate how the SSTO may open up the space lanes to commerce in the same way that the Yankee Clipper ship opened the sea lanes. The program is about turning this vision into a reality. And uh, so I want to talk first about our, our vision, then about the program, which we think very quickly will turn vision to reality. Hardware flying is the fulfillment of our vision. It's our goal that before the end of this century, that everyone in this room, after me, gets to fly on this and uh, travel to space. And it may be for business or simply for pleasure. Then space will truly become a, a third routine mode of transportation we think will complement surface and air. For the vision. Flights ought to start at a spaceport, and this is our launch simplex where your Delta Clipper Model 3 or simply DC-3 for short, will land, take off, uh, be maintained and serviced between its daily flights to space. And the spaceport will contain the normal complement of uh, buildings, uh, maintenance hangars, administration buildings, a uh, flight operations control center, areas for uh, receiving uh, cargo, passenger lounges, be surrounded by new startup businesses uh, like fast space freight forwarding companies will open, uh, hotels and so on. And a whole new economy, we believe, will flourish around space once it's open on a routine basis. The passenger may wait in the passenger lounge, watch the uh, Delta Clipper take off, land, may watch your uh, your Delta Clipper being service preparatory to flight. Servicing of the Delta Clipper, uh, most all of that will be done on the launch stand by a crew of certified mechanics preparing the, uh, the Delta Clipper for its flight. The launch stand is just that, uh, eight retractable posts that the Delta Clipper sits on uh, while it's being serviced, uh, fueled, then it literally flies off those as it takes off for, uh, for space. So this is the mechanics making their walk around inspection prior to flight up in the cargo deck area. Uh, mechanic uh, will, will check out, perhaps replace uh, some of the smaller electronic boxes, all of which are, are located for rapid servicing, uh, just as we service an airliner. For the cargo, that's handling will be streamlined, and we'll talk about containerized cargo handling, the same way that uh, the airlines, uh, <coughs> Express, UPS do in, in handling freight. In this manner, a, uh, a standardized container would be shipped to the uh, could be shipped to the payload manufacturer or his fast freight forwarder, and the uh, entire payload encapsulated in there. And uh, that could take a day, a week, an hour, a month, uh, whatever. But when the cargo is ready, uh, the supplier will ship that to the spaceport, be brought out on a standard scissor jack truck, lifted up into the cargo bay, inserted. And in about an hour's time, through uh, standard hookups, the uh, 
cargo be ready to be carried to its destination in space or perhaps halfway around the world. Operations are uh, greatly simplified. Uh, Vision three people handling all of the, uh, the basic uh, operations for the launch and flight. The two people sitting here on the left are the flight crew, two-person crew. Uh, because the Delta Clipper is really all autonomous in terms of all of its onboard flight control systems, the flight crew is, is there not as stick and rudder people, but are there to, to monitor the system, make sure the mission is, is going as planned, service the payload, and the mission. That flight crew may be seated on the ground in a virtual cockpit, as they're shown here, or they may be actually on board the, uh, the Delta Clipper. Third position is uh, for the member of the uh, Ground Operation Control Center, and uh, he handles all the loading of the, uh, of the Delta Clipper, sees to its maintenance, makes certain that the proper uh, replacement parts are there to uh, maintain a smooth flow of the maintenance and rapid turnaround of the vehicle. If you're a passenger, you would get into your passenger compartment. This is modeled after our uh, twin deck MD-12 with uh, passenger seating there, uh, all with window seats. You would be uh, towed out to the waiting Delta Clipper on a standard uh, scissor jack type of truck and put up and uh, in, into the uh, passenger compartment area, ready to go to space. Flight time, the uh, flight crew starts the engines and uh, they go into an idle mode, make certain that all systems are operating and going. Then you basically turn over the flight to the onboard uh, computer system. It brings the engines up to uh, the takeoff power and you literally fly off the stand on your way to orbit. There are multiple engines uh, on the vehicle. So just like a good transport design, you do have engine out capability, built-in redundancy on, uh, on all systems so that you always have the uh, capability of safe return back to your <coughs> launch site in the event of any uh, failures, including engine out failures. Once in space, do a multitude of different missions, uh, maybe as simple as lifting cargo to space, uh, deploying satellites at the uh, low Earth orbit, uh, deploying satellites maybe with booster engines to take them on up to geosynchronous orbit. Uh, since you also come back, you can also use this to, uh, to retrieve cargo from space and bring it back. Gives you the capability of having a real space logistics system, being able to take up re replacement parts, uh, Sustaining cargo, for example, on the, uh, the space station could become the life support line, if you will, between Earth and, and space, bringing up cargo, bringing back uh, completed experiments, as well as bringing passengers, crew members, to and from space station. Uh, maybe a crew that's going on up the space station uh, to spend the, the week, the month, uh, a weekend there uh, with could be a, a crew of people going to a man-tended uh, manufacturing site to retrieve product and uh, set up for another manufacturing run. <coughs> or it could be, uh, as I intend to be, uh, just a tourist for the uh, what I think is probably one of the most spectacular tourist trips you could ever take. Delta Clipper can help uh, develop its own in-space infrastructure, the capability for refueling. And with in-flight, uh, in-space refueling and uh, modifications uh, to extend the on-orbit lifetime of the uh, propellants, <coughs> the whole space between uh, low Earth orbit and, and the lunar surface is now accessible to you. And that can be used, for example, for flying to the moon. If you're at the moon, 
where else would you land but in one of our lunar lava tube moon bases? <laughs> Or you may want to go out and uh, do some prospecting, uh, see what's on one of the asteroids, whether it's worthwhile mining, setting up operations. Or it may be that one of these days, this whole meeting can be held at L5, and we'll all be passing. Wherever you've been, once you're ready to return, the, uh, you point the nose of the Delta Clipper back towards your your home spaceport, and you fly back. You are in fact a an optimized hypersonic uh, flying wing. Fly back stabilized by uh, the aero control surfaces. As you come back into the atmosphere, lose speed, go subsonic. You'll do a rotation maneuver. Uh, to uh, bring your vehicle into the base first position for landing because we land just like we take off in a vertical position. If you land, to get prepared to land, you'll start all beta your engines into an idle mode, in a standby mode, and then uh, bring up four of the engines, once your base forward, bring up four of the engines to landing power and decelerate and land at the site next to your uh, launch stand. Once you land, the vehicle shuts itself down uh, autonomously. The ground crew will come out, attach wheels to the uh, to your landing gear, and you're ready then to uh, tow the vehicle right back over to the launch stand, unload the uh, passengers, cargo, uh, service the vehicle, refuel it, get ready for the next flight. That's our basic vision. The exciting part is that it's, it's happening. And it's happening under a program sponsored by the SDIO on the single stage rocket technology in the phase two program in which we are validating that the basic technology and concepts of operations that you need to make a single stage orbit, a rapid turnaround system that can operate like an airliner, uh, make certain that the technology, engineering capabilities are all in place and ready to go. Just a couple of engineering details on the, on the system concept. So said we take off vertically like a uh, Delta rocket fly to space. Uh, with a couple of major exceptions. But the fact that we do uh, have multiple engines gives us engine out capability. The invent of, a, of an engine failure, for example, any time uh, during flight, you have the option of returning uh, to your original launch site. Uh, you have the option of continuing on into uh, orbit, maybe a low Earth orbit, do a single orbit around the Earth, return safely to your launch site or maybe even continuing on with your mission. The other capability it gives you uh, with multiple engines is the capability of flying on through winds aloft. And so holes and delays because it happens to be blowing at higher altitudes will no longer be a restriction. Flying back, uh, so we, we fly back like a, an optimized flying wing. Um, able to control, moderate the temperatures, minimizing temperatures on the, uh, on the vehicle, <coughs> minimize uh, decelerations returning are a little over one and an eight Gs. We do limit the acceleration going on up to orbit uh, to three Gs or less. So it's a fairly benign ride uh, going up and coming back, both for passengers and cargo, and also for the basic vehicle itself, which helps to extend the lifetime of the vehicle that we intend and are designing the Delta Clipper just as we would an airliner for a lifetime of 20 years. They said uh, as we come down, we start engines, do a rotation maneuver, decelerate, and land at the base. Because uh, by definition, uh, we're landing vertically using the power of our engines to decelerate us, uh, we are a powered lander. And that has a major advantage then because just as winds aloft, 
don't interrupt your operation. Winds and gusts at the landing site when you want to come down and land or rain uh, doesn't bother you because you have the control authority then that it takes to land in all types of operational weather. Heavy emphasis of uh, making this system, the Delta Clipper, operate like an airliner. And indeed, we're using the basic concepts uh, that our Douglas Aircraft Company and the commercial side has used, developing the MD-11, be introduced to the MD-12. The whole concept of uh, two levels of operation of uh, maintenance on and off the vehicle. That design starts with the systems that uh, go into the vehicle itself, the redundancy built in, the ability to, to continually monitor the health of your systems, uh, see what needs to be replaced or repaired when you land, such that most of those can be rapidly done uh, in the launch stand area itself. Uh, more major repairs that uh, might be required would tow the vehicle back to the hangar, say if you had to change an engine out, uh, could be done in a, a week's time or less. And uh, just like an airliner, you'll have semi-annual inspections to make certain that your vehicle is operating within the certification boundaries. Indeed, uh, just like an airliner, as we design and build the vehicle, we'll design and build it to be certified for flight, certify the flight, fleet of vehicles for flight, and just as you do commercial airliners. Talk a little bit about payload concepts and handling. Uh, we provide then a, a number of different types of, uh, of standard payload containers that would accommodate the, the, the payloads uh, by the various uh, uh, payload manufacturers, allow them to do their integration offline from the, uh, the basic Delta Clipper operations, bring it to the spaceport, launch, and go. All of this will really help to drive us to the, the bottom of this curve. Where you need to be is, is down the lower corner in terms of, uh, of cost per flight to orbit. If you look at where we are in the existing expendable fleets and uh, where, the, where we are in the international market, uh, it costs upwards of uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 million dollars every time you fly. And the basic reason is that most of the costs involved, over two-thirds of the costs involved in today's flight, are simply because you throw away your vehicle every time. And uh, it's hard to imagine, and you can't imagine, any commercial airliner making profits. They threw away their MD-11 or 747 after every flight. And that's essentially what we're doing in space. And it's kind of the blinding flash of the obvious, that you can use your vehicle each time, you can maintain it every time for flight in a rapid manner, you can drive costs down. And B, we believe that uh, getting costs down to the order of a few million dollars per flight is not only feasible, it is reasonable. What we're doing in our single stage rocket technology then is, is the first step. We think we'll introduce an entire new era of space, and uh, we are developing, as part of this program, a, a third-scale Delta Clipper vehicle, which will fly at a mini spaceport. And that mini spaceport will be located at White Sands and have all of the same operating functions, capabilities, uh, just as we would in the operational system. Uh, from there, there are paths you can go, continue to pursue, in, in terms of developing applications for some orbital rockets that could uh, benefit from low cost of operation, reusable low cost operations in the same way that orbital rockets could, or going on into this path of developing the single stage uh, to orbit system, which proposed going on next into developing the, the prototype or the DCY preparatory to the first operational fleet. key to this program has really been the drive to design not for the last second of ISP performance or the last bit of weight that you can put in orbit, but design from the beginning for supportability and operability. Uh, do the performance that you need to carry the, the weight to orbit that you require, but to drive down 
the operational costs uh, to the minimum that's consistent with, with safe operations. Also, to get on with it. And uh, this year I'm showing you a lot of pretty view graphs. Next year, I want to be able to show flying hardware. We believe it's essential to get hardware out and it's flying because it's only if you get out and actually operate, get your hands on, get burned, get make mistakes, learn from those, back to those back into your design, not only in the vehicle, but in the operation side, equally important, are we really going to get down into routine operations. What we are building, as I said, is a one scale, third scale version of the of the operational vehicle called our experimental or DCX and it will emulate all of the same type of flight function. We'll be able to go through the autonomous uh, automatic checkout of the system in the same way we would our operational system. <coughs> We're developing all of the uh, maintenance requirements, the timelines, defining the number of people involved, spares, and so on. So we'll be able to validate our models, if you will, for the operations of this in the same way that we'll be able to validate our flight performance. Flight control center for the DCX will be the same as for the operational vehicle, three people. A two-person flight crew and a single person operating the ground operation system. All the types of displays, functions, software we'll be developing in here will have a direct carryover into the operational system. Flight will be the same. We'll uh, take off vertically, land vertically, exercise all the same types of uh, onboard autonomous control systems, including a uh, GPS updated uh, guidance navigation system. Flight and landing uh, will go through the same type of sequence, and the uh, really uh, demonstrating the, uh, the, the takeoff, the ascent, start of the ascent trajectory to orbit. Exception will do a pull-up maneuver to uh, put us at around a 30,000 foot altitude or so, starting into the flyback mode and demonstrate our old uh, rotation, uh, powered landing maneuver set down. Between all of the, uh, the various flight sequences we'll be carrying out, we'll be doing the same type of <coughs> maintenance, ground functions as we will for the operational system. The, uh, Vehicle will shut itself down autonomously. Flight crew, the uh, ground crew, will come out, attach wheels to the landing gear, tow it back to the uh, to the stand, and prepare it for the next flight. The other part of the program it is uh, moving along at a rapid pace, and uh, rapid programs generally are much more efficient, both in terms of utilization of people, your resources, as well as significantly reducing uh, costs. We awarded the, uh, the contract in August, on uh, requirements given in October, completed our initial design review in February, complete our final review in uh, June, including release of all of our production drawings, the, uh, software is under development, uh, parts procurements are underway, uh, parts are being fabricated, the uh, four engines that we'll use on the DCX are modifications of the Pratt Whitney RL10 engines for being modified to operate at white sands uh, altitudes and full throttling capability. Uh, those are being fabricated and uh, first engine firing on those will be uh, coming up in the middle of next month. Uh, Aerojet's making our uh, gas, gas, hydrogen reaction control systems. First firings of those have been completed. We're on into the uh, production of those systems. As I said, uh, software development is underway. The, uh, all of the parts uh, will begin to be assembled in the July uh, through December time period, so that in December of this year, we will have assembled at Huntington Beach our total uh, DCX system. The vehicle, the flight operations control center, the major interfaces for all the ground operational systems. We'll be able to do a complete checkout there. On the 15th of January of next year, we will ship the entire system down to White Sands. 
uh, first going into the NASA White Sands Test Facility, and uh, we'll be doing our first uh, total system firing test there. We look at the, uh, the whole development program, the test program for the X, the same way as we would a aircraft development in terms of doing flight envelope expansion. <coughs> that the uh, first test will be akin to, uh, to ramp tests there. We'll tie the vehicle down, be able to do exercise, all of the hardware, software, including all of the engine firings. With those sets of tests completed, then we'll move the vehicle flight operation control center over to the White Sands Missile Range, where we're, as I said, we're developing our mini spaceport at the uh, Space Harbor which is the emergency landing site for the shuttle. And uh, on the 23rd of April next year, we'll have our first test. And uh, that'll probably be uh, early in the morning when it's calm. It'll be a simple, like, fly around the runway. We'll take off vertically, hover, translate, set back down on the landing gear, thereby uh, check out a lot of our, our flight functions, uh, a lot of the air <coughs> interactions, and so on. Later flight sequences and series so will go to higher altitudes, come down at, uh, at higher velocities. Uh, we'll operate later in the day as so we pick up winds and gusts at, at white sands to show our ability to, uh, to land under those conditions. And finally, in our third uh, flight sequence, we'll, uh, we'll take off onto our ascent trajectory, or we'll pull-up maneuver, get us into our flyback mode, rotation, and, and total landing. As I said, between all of those tests, we'll be demonstrating the ability for rapid turnaround of the vehicle, demonstrating and validating the whole operations concept, that indeed a few people can maintain rapidly turn around a vehicle that just happens to, uh, to go to space and back. The team that's in, uh, involved here is an international team uh, with McDonnell Douglas. Uh, prime company is their space systems company in Huntington Beach. Uh, Douglas Aircraft Company, as I mentioned, is working heavily with us in introducing all of the concepts of uh, commercial operations. McDonnell Aircraft, uh, together with Harris and Honeywell, are bringing, putting together all of the vehicle avionics. And there, again, you can borrow great gobs of, uh, of already existing hardware, techniques, methods uh, from the aircraft industry and apply them directly to, uh, to this system. Electronics company is working with us on the, uh, the black boxes and the integration. The uh, missiles company is working with us on the, the propellant acquisition system and the McDonnell Douglas Research Laboratories in the uh, computational fluid dynamics studies. Aerojet and Pratt & Whitney, as I mentioned, are working on the development of the uh, propulsion system, Floor Daniel, the architect and engineering. Mark Marietta is our teammate of the off the ground operations cryogenic handling. Uh, MBB uh, of uh, Germany is working with us on the uh, landing gear design based on previous work they had done in that area, as well as bringing some interesting uh, thermal protection systems <coughs> to us from their Sanger program. Scale Composites is a, a small company in Mojave uh, run by Bert Rutan. Uh, they're building the uh, all-composite aero shell for us. And uh, those of you who have been over to the Smithsonian have seen the, the world's first single-staged orbit, the Voyager. It would just happen to be a lower orbit. <laughs> <laughs> and he's demonstrated it, and uh, now he's got one that's a little bit higher altitude. Uh, Space Guild is a small entrepreneurial company, which we think is important to uh, begin looking at how this space is going to develop and what the future needs for uh, space transportation are going to be once we're in an era of having driven costs down. Where do we stand today? 335 days to our first flight. We think with that, we'll introduce truly a, a revolution in space transportation. And with that, a revolution in, in how we think and operate and use space. Thank you.
probably time for a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, what, uh, a couple questions, real quick. One, how uh, close does it look like you'll get this done on the schedule? And two, of the 50 some odd million you're getting from the government, is that the entire cost of the program or is McDonnell Douglas picking up part of the cost? Okay, uh, confidence on the schedule is very high right now. Uh, and, uh, I have a countdown board outside my office that everybody sees when they come in to work in the morning. It, it ticks away and we're continuing to be on schedule. And we're seeing no, no issues that uh, stand in our way of, of making that. Uh, we're getting marvelous, wonderful cooperation uh, from the folks down at White Sands, uh, both on the NASA and uh, on the range and the Army side. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's really exciting to have a, uh, have a charged up, motivated team that uh, you almost can't hardly wait to get to work in the morning and, and surprise when uh, four or five o'clock rolls over. So I think we're uh, we're on schedule and, and we intend to, intend to keep that schedule. So I think it's important that uh, we return to, to, to doing business and showing we can do business like we used to do. And uh, we used to make hardware, and, and Max Hunter, who works with us on this, uh, chides me all the time because he was program engineer for the Thor. He said, hey, we did that in less than a year. What's taking you so long? <laughs> and, uh, but you can do it. And, and American industry can do it. And, and we can do it. And we're going to, I think that's one of the goals of this program as well, is to show that the capability is there, uh, given the range to, uh, to go do it. Uh, the other question on uh, we are funded at about 58 million for the total program, and that's the other challenge. And uh, and why not? And uh, given challenges, engineers always have a way of rising to them. And uh, we're going to do it for that budget. Uh, we have invested a lot of money. Part of that is from the marvelous interaction that's occurred between this program and the NAS program. Uh, we've been involved in that. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the computational tools, for example, that we as a company developed, and we spent uh, over 200 million of our after tax profit dollars in investing in, in the NAS program, not just for NASP itself, but for what it represented as a whole family of vehicles. And we look at this as kind of the first derivative vehicle from NAS, and uh, we intend to make it work. Yes, sir. I uh, have a question on the uh, SDI office, you know, pushing Craig on the to fund the second phase on their own. And yeah, I wonder if you have any comments on that. And if the work going to be funded in terms of having a problem with us, if you can tell us if you're going to be in the financial position to do it on its own. Well, let's see. The, uh, they haven't been quite that open about wanting uh, us to fund it. Uh, we would look at this, I think, in the long run, as anybody would, as a potential for a new commercial system. And uh, if, you know, right now, as everybody knows, we're trying to finance and develop the MD-12. Or if you look at Boeing and their 777 or new Airbuses or whatever, uh, commercial, new commercial systems you know, end up costing you six, seven billion dollars or so. And uh, that's not an unreasonable investment in, uh, in knowing an established market. Uh, the market that I believe personally is there for space, I think will develop, but it's one that's hard to quantify. The market today is like, what, 50 launches a year? And uh, you know, that doesn't even keep the Delta Clipper busy. And, uh, so I think part of what we're looking at is the need and I think there's a, uh, an interest and realization within the administration today that what is needed is a basic space transportation infrastructure put into place in the same way that the Eisenhower administration put in the interstate highway systems. You know, the, the trucking companies didn't pay for it, but they certainly benefited from it. So did all of the gas stations and the roadside businesses and everything that, that grew up as a result of that. Um, so I guess we're not rushing in to invest that money uh, now, but look for it as a, as a future opportunity. Yes? Do you see gas stations going up in every city and town for DC getting free toy in that? 
don't know if it'll be every city in town, but the interesting thing on the, the Delta Clipper is that as single stage and the ability to operate, it can, can operate out of every state, uh, multiple locations in the state if you want. So no longer do you have to be necessarily blessed by a coastal site to be able to, to dump solid stages off on the way up. Uh, we can fly to space and then indeed our goal is a uh, uh, New Mexico is going to be a southwest region spaceport and uh, we'll fly out polar orbits or easterly or southerly uh, just like they do out of El Paso Airport. Yes? Single stage orbit flights have been the holy grail of the transportation business for so long. Can you say how much of what you're going to be able to do with an operational vehicle? How much of the trick is the propulsion of nanoparticles and materials? And are there any other tricks? <laughs> Well, there's three basic things that have occurred in, uh, in the last uh, 30 years. And you're right, single stage has been around. Uh, you know, Jules Verne had a great one. Uh, just a real kick in the pants. But the, uh, in the 60s, uh, single stage was seriously considered as a candidate for, for the shuttle. And uh, the basic materials that were available at the time uh, resulted in very heavy structures. The propulsion uh, was several seconds lower than what you'd like. Also, the uh, supporting avionics was not as sophisticated and as compact as we have today. All three of those have developed in the last 30 years. Uh, avionics, as I said, we can lift those right out of commercial military airplanes to use. Propulsion, all the performance you need demonstrated by the shuttle and the SSMEs. <coughs> actually, what we're using is, is actually less performance than what you get from the SSMEs, but we've derated those in favor of longer life, lower maintenance. The other area is in structures and materials, and there uh, we profited by the enormous uh, advancements in composite materials. Uh, you know, we, there are all composite airplanes made now, our Harrier program uh, vehicle, for example, is half composite. And that allows you to make lighter weight, robust, uh, rugged structures that allow you to design with margin. Once you can design with margin, then you can get long life. The long life drives the maintenance cost down, and all the costs really spiral down. So it's those combination of those three that have kind of culminated now, and we can just reach and scrape them off the shelf and use them. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. The uh, uh, passenger version of this thing, I look at your reentry profile, I notice this nose first. It's going to put the passengers in rather nasty uh, negative Gs. What are you, are you going to put the, are they, are you going to We've had some interesting design studies, and if you attend Barbara Skronsky's uh, session this afternoon on our educational outreach, uh, we've had some high school students, in fact, interested in that problem. And they're, they're marvelously simple solution. You can do like rotate your seat. Yes, sir. Would you be able to give us a wild guess or a ballpark figure on what a uh, tourist trip into orbit might cost, even an order of magnitude? Order of magnitude of a, of a, of a nice cruise. Uh, so instead of going to, to Alaska for the summer, uh, take a spin around the world. What, what price range? Oh, and initially, and there have been a number of studies on this, and, uh, and some books written on it, and, and they talk about uh, kind of the elite phase starting at uh, anywhere from $100,000 a, a trip uh, on down to where you kind of have the exploration phase pay down to, uh, you know, to half of that, down to 10, uh, 10 thousand. Uh, the economics of it, you know, really come with the frequency of the flight. Uh, the more you fly this vehicle, the, the cheaper it becomes to operate because you have a fixed number of people that are there servicing and maintaining it, almost irrespective of whether you fly once a year or, or once a day. And uh, tourism, by the way, though, is, is, is a marvelous way to increase the frequency of flights and thereby drive costs down and everybody can. Wait a minute. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, you mentioned certification. Have you looked at whether the FAA, NASA, or some other organization is going to certify this vehicle for manned flight? Yeah, we've talked with the Department of Transport, uh, which would be probably analogous to an FAA certification. Uh, again, it's a combination of, of certifying your design process, your maintenance process, as well as the inherent safety system that's been. Thanks, I'm in the second. No, let's see, uh, let me correct that impression. We're not using a derated SSME. I'm saying the performance we need is representative of what's been demonstrated, but it would not be an SSME. It would be a, a different engine uh, and operating at a lower performance level, hence giving us longer time. Um, with respect to uh, performance and so on, our, our, our feeling there is, is to keep it simple to operate economically uh, just using single fuel, uh, then so be it. Uh, it. We can be shown that other developments are coming along that could be introduced. Uh, those can be introduced then as, as, as upgrades. Sure. No. no right. We're designed for use of multiple engines, just like you know, MD-11 and so on can fly with Rolls Royce engines. Uh, we have a particular engine design uh, that we're, we're working through. Okay. You uh, mentioned that there could be bases or uh, spaceports in every state. Is there, would there not be a problem with signing moons as the Concorde is restricted to this uh, uh, Sound is, is a concern, both on, uh, on takeoff. Flight profile is pretty well takes off vertically, and uh, so some of you who've ever lived next to an airport, or any of you from St. Louis and Lambert Field, F 15s take off straight. Uh, it, it, it's noisy at, at ground zero, if you will, uh, but the noise footprint is, is pretty well restricted in the whole area. Uh, coming back, uh, we go subsonic at uh, very high altitude. 70,000 feet and uh, you know their uh, reduced uh, footprint uh, comes from the fact that as you come back in you're a lightly loaded vehicle and uh, that tends to go with the weight of the vehicle. I got this uh, space news letter uh, a few weeks ago basically as a sample and uh, one of the things there it says I just read very small portion of it. it says SDIO urged to drop Delta Clipper test flights. A government panel wants the SDI organization to abandon plans for some of those test flights that have done those as Delta Clipper Clipper single stage orbit. Instead, SDIO should focus on developing lightweight materials and heat resistant systems that the full scale vehicle would need. It says the National Research Council and it goes on. Uh, my question is, uh, are there any valid concerns here, or is this merely an entrenched mindset that is uh, voicing itself? Well, it's a, uh, it's a different, different approach and, uh, and a different outlook. As I mentioned, uh, we believe that um, the value of the demonstration flight is not only filling in some of the database that you need for basic apparel, ground effects that you really get by flying a substantial vehicle. Equally important is, is validating and understanding the, the concept of operations. And uh, that is where the real cost savings, the real operational simplicity, is. that's where the profit is to be made, if you will, in, in terms of the uh, concept of support. And that you can uh, continue to, to, to theorize about and, and make studies but until you actually get out and, and operate real hardware, you don't understand. <coughs> and uh, nor is a uh, community of, of users going to believe 
that you can really uh, turn around a uh, fleet of vehicles with 90 people uh, until you actually get out and give them some hard evidence. So that's what we'll be doing with this. And it's, uh, I think uh, the NRC looked at it more from a uh, scientific mode of looking at, again at, uh, you, you can always invent something better to use. And uh, our feeling is when something better is invented, uh, we'll use it if it's cost effective. Uh, but the materials are there now, and uh, you know, so why ignore them and make the problem more difficult? But they're not in a position to uh, interfere in the process that's going on. No, I think it, it's healthy debate. You, know, you all want to put all the issues out on the table. I think I'm getting the cut some. Thank you very much. talk about her education. You talk about a bunch of motivated students. Uh, we're, we're having a lot of fun with this. And I have